I, uh, Brass Facts here. A combination of playing way too much Stalker Gamma and Discord conversations that come up like seasonal herpes has me looking to tackle the topic of bugging out. I'm gonna do this a little bit off the cuff, I've got some notes, but you know, let's, let's get into it. This concept is not new by any means, by the way. Uh, it was probably the predominant survival strategy according to internet forms circa 2010 to 2014, probably even before that. The premise is simple. Most of you, like 95% of you, live within 30 minutes to an hour of in a city, and cities, during shit hit the fan, are assumed to be instantaneous death traps. Therefore, the logic goes, grab your go bag, jump into your car, and head over to the winch, no, and survive in the woods, avoid the city, and live out the movie Red Dawn, preferably with the girls included. Why is someone gr angle grinding metal in my fucking parking lot? By the way, I've never actually watched the original Red Dawn movie until like six months ago. I know, I know, required viewing, crucify me in the comments. It's worth saying, because I know some of you are probably not getting this, uh, when I say bug out, I'm referring to those that intend to bug out to basically, well, nowhere, just off in the woods. So this topic is exclusively for those and excluding those that have a dedicated, provisioned bug out location. So this isn't about you. You guys are actually pretty set, kind of jealous, kind of want to do something like that. Anyways, like with the game Stalker, Fallout, and The Last of Us, there is a certain romantic appeal to having nothing but the pack on your shoulders, your rifle, preferably a dog, making your way through the post-apocalyptic wasteland, with likely a somber tune playing. Too bad it's all mostly bullshit. As per usual, I'll hit you with the disclaimers. I don't know what the fuck I'm talking about. No one really does when it comes to predicting something like that. We've seen similar events worldwide, but these are entirely unique in nature, uh, and it's a poor predictor of other such things. That being said, the fundamental premise of bugging out and then living off the lands is basically completely incongruent with my experience over the years. I've done several weeks plus long living out of rucks. I've even taught some minor, minor survival courses. While by no means an expert, all of my limited experience tells me uh, fucking off in the woods with just a bag or even a week's worth of supply is significantly worse than just staying at home at the best of scenarios and at the worst of scenarios is basically just enhanced suicide. Why? Well, that's, uh, that's the point of today's video. All versions of bugging out make one fundamental assumptions. No matter how much food you can bring, how many supplies you can bring, you'll eventually need to transition to living off the land. That means food, water, shelter, and more, all of it must be procured in large part off of the land. To save us all some time, I'm gonna be focusing entirely on static bug out scenarios or semi-static, basically those that bug out until sufficiently far away from major population centers, around 30 to 50 miles at minimum, such that the actual purpose of bugging out, avoiding the preponderance of people, is achieved. The, mo the nomadic version of this, where you do all of the above, but you stay mobile living out of a bag, I'm going to dismiss basically entirely out of hand. You'll soon see why, but essentially take all the issues I'll discuss today and dial the difficulty to, I don't know, 69, 420. The already tight margins present when bugging out statically are going to be beyond razor thin when all you can carry with you has to fit into like a 60 liter bag. It's worth noting as we go through this, I'm not necessarily saying any of this is impossible. Of course it's not impossible, but the risk proposition compared to staying at home is pretty poorly skewed. Have you ever been on the verge of hypothermia in 100 degree weather? No? I don't care. Introducing the military surplus poncho liner, also known as the Wubby, a cheap, effective, compact piece of gear to ensure that you die of heat stroke in the desert. <laughs> on a serious note, this video, not Ryan's Heat Stroke, was sponsored by Ventures Surplus. You know the drill, they have a wide range of military surplus gear, both new and used for dirt cheap on their site. They're currently running a deal for the Wubby for $32.99, and if you use my code below, you also shave off another 10%. Ventures Surplus wants me to let you guys know, this will be one of the last great shipments of the Poncho Liner and M81 anywhere. So once these go, that's it, you're not gonna see these prices again. For like the three of you living under a rock, the Wubby or Poncho liner is a nice you know, blanket-like liner 
that is both compact, durable, and looks fly as hell. So if you want one, now's the time. Anyways, back to the video. And thanks, Venture Surplus. The big issue, one of the biggest issues, is food. Humans burn much of their caloric requirement to simply exist, even if all you do is stare at a computer all day. Add in any physical requirements of a post-scenario event, and the requirement goes through the roof. On a long enough time scale, calories in must equal calories out. And any imbalance with this will destroy your ability to be a useful, functional human being as your body begins to eat itself to stay alive. In a bug out scenario, this will begin what many call like a death loop of sorts as you begin to lose the strength to go get calories. Thus, you have an even larger calorie deficit, which means it becomes even harder to get the calories and you kind of just end up in a spiral of destruction. This is why a cornerstone of preparedness is provisioning a large amount of food. Even if you were fortunate enough to live kind of out there where you have your own farm, you have chickens, you know, you know, crops, you name it, it's always good to have some backup. When you bug out, even with a vehicle, you're essentially giving up all of this. Sure, you can probably bring a month's worth of food if generous in the back of your pickup, but whatever you think you can bring, it pales into comparison to even modest static storage. Most people are not intimately familiar with how much room calories take up, and no, 4,000 buckets of peanut butter as your sole calorie source is not a real prep, you're gonna suck start a pistol when you get to like the third tub of it. For the hyper serious prepper, that ends up being the ultimate plan, right? Food preps combined with efficient farming, animals, vegetable farms, opportunistic hunting, and if things go right, it can be extended for a very long duration. But of course, when we switch the dynamic to bugging out, we don't have any of this. You must basically right away begin to entirely subsist off the land you end up stopping at. I know many outdoorsmen that believe they can hunt, fish, and gather their way out of this, and subsist off the land as man once did. But let's examine that concept for a second. Most wild animals are pretty smart and know how to avoid humans if they want to. Their sense of smell is quite well refined. For those that ever operated in bear country, you're told to have basically new bags, new clothes, and such that have not been recently washed with, you know, detergent, which generally means you just buy all new shit because the scent persists and tends to attract bears. Yes, this actually happened to a dude in my group that left an old spice, you know, deodorant in his bag and then put it into the bear bag. The group after us also had a similar issue, I think with a Dr. Pepper, hilarious of all things. How no one got eaten is fucking beyond me. Which, I could also discuss how predators uh, would interact in scenarios like that. They seem rare now, but that's because they generally don't like humans and human settlements. Uh, but when you're on their turf, they will easily fuck your shit up. But different story. Anyways, most animals are not predators and will simply just make a wide berth around you and the impact on the environment you've made. That's an issue when your whole game plan becomes to, you know, eat them. Certain rural towns might give you the wrong impression where all the deer act like complete jackasses and get run over daily and walk right up to people's homes and eat in their garden. But those animals have gotten used to human presence and understand that they're not going to get shot because usually it's illegal to do so. But those things are going to get slaughtered pretty early on. Now, yes, you will occasionally have success. You can jerkify or smoke meat such that it lasts a long time but the requirement of needing to have near constant success is not something most hunters are capable of doing, no matter how good, because we do not live in the same lands our ancestors used to live in. Continental United States simply does not have the same biomass of four-legged animals that it used to, and it will take generations for that to recover in a post-collapse scenario. You can, of course, fish, trap, and gather, but I think people generally overestimate how many calories, say, a squirrel has. The answer is less than 500, it's, it's a fuzzy rat. They also taste like complete ass, really more of a stew or dog food type thing. You can of course fish, but you can also overfish. Since many of the US reservoirs are actually just seeded and not able to effectively support a fish population because they lack the design to allow for effective spawning. Now, you might end up somewhere with a native fish population. I can name several, but you have to remember the whole point of this was to avoid interacting with other people for risk aversion sake. And these lakes that actually can support a real environment tend to attract people. Now there is also the gathering aspect, but I'll be real, have you guys actually tried it? It's a lot of work for like no calories during a time frame where work is incredibly important and every hour of the daylight matters. Gathering is more of a tertiary thing you do while doing other stuff. There are other areas that have plentiful fish, plentiful game, animals seem to be fucking everywhere. And if you live in one of these locations, more power to you. Hell yeah. 
But if you live in these isolated areas, you typically don't even need the bug out because you already live there, completely bypassing the whole point of these videos. For most of us, these isolated locations are very far away and you're not gonna be able to get there even on a full tank of gas and the highway is completely clear and certainly obviously impossible to get to on foot. None of these things don't work. I've done these things. I've been in the wild for two to three weeks on end where we had to subsist off of the land. We had the fish and in some cases we even hunted. I'm gonna do it. Let's do it. I can, I can, I can feel the sun sapping Ryan's motivation. Oh yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, gang, gang. Yeah, yeah, gang, gang. Gang, gang. I can't focus with the tinkling noise. <laughs> More than three taps is playing with it. The next aspect of bugging out that is often forgotten is the critical and non-critical supplies that are, you know, not food or water. By the very nature of bugging out, supplies we bring will almost always be critical in nature because we don't have room to even bring all of those, which means non-critical items are certainly gonna be left behind. Even the biggest jam-packed $70,000 Forerunner setup, it will lack the room to deal with a wide range of problems over a long enough time frame. Can you deal with infections, colds? Do you have enough gauze to deal with back-to-back -back wounds? Can you make sutures? How long until you deplete the batteries of critical tactical gear? How long until your nylon begins to tear and can you repair it? How do you have spare sets of clothes, cold weather gear, spare water filters, knife sharpening, gear repair kits, whatever. How about the mundane day-to-day -day shit? Uh, Non-critical medical, hygiene, repair equipment, pre-packaged portable snacks, TP, contact lens fluid, extra contact lenses, because, you know, I'm a cripple, vitamins, Gatorade, extra water filtration, backup panels, backup batteries, backup... Fuck time. I'm pretty sure I repeated myself like 12 times there. Whatever, you get the point. In the short term, I'm sure you can function without a lot of these things, but in the long term, a lot of these non-criticals will quickly start feeling really fucking critical. And you won't have them, and that's gonna cause problems. Now, you can kind of station yourself closer to civilization such that you can do, you know, uh, scavenging parties, but then you're within walking distance of civilization, which once again defeats the whole point of bugging out in the first place. Okay, so you're probably not entirely convinced, and that's fair. Humans are resilient and we can overcome many challenges. But that gets me to the actual point of this video and why I think bugging out is basically an impossibility in most parts of the world, or at least not a smart value proposition in terms of risk reward. And that's margins. You have like no margins. Yes, some of you will have the skill set and the environment to allow for all of this to take place. Most of you won't. And some of you might even have the skill set and the ability to do this with the stuff that you can fit in your bag or car. Some of you will have small enough groups or lean enough groups that you don't need to worry about family, kids, mothers, whatever. And basically everyone in your group is a Giga Chad fighting H male able to kind of carry their own load or weight. But you must contend with luck, statistics, and ultra-tight margins. Survival in the wilderness is built on margins, and tight ones at that, because you don't have much with you. When you go camping, rucking, or hunting, or even a survival training course, you obviously plan to succeed, and you plan to fail. Or more than likely just get incredibly unlucky, such that you can't deal with that problem. Right now, that just means beast mode it for 12 hours and reach civilization. You could live off your fat reserves and tough it out. You get the shits, no biggie, let's go home early. Homie slices his foot open out with an ax, ah, track it out, go to the ER. Get soaked through in freezing water, ah, drop all your gear and just walk right the fuck out to your car 10 miles away, go get the shit later. In a real scenario, you obviously can't do any of this. So despite man's extreme resilience, we can only handle so many bad things piling up until it becomes a serious issue. And bad things will happen, they happen a lot. You're gonna have bad luck hunting, you're gonna have bad luck fishing, especially as, you know, the density of animals begins to deplete, be it either to overfishing or overhunting, or maybe winter just lasted an extra long time and you've burned through your entire food reserve. I think it's really easy to look at these survival shows and see success and ignore all the failures or close calls that aren't shown or are ignored. Or the reality that none of these shows really go on for any more time than a month. In the real world, you don't get an out or have a medical team on standby or get the phone home. You don't get a redo. It only takes one bad streak of failed hunting, one bad streak of sickness being passed around, one bad fall, and it's over. Even if you're willing to contend with all this, willing to risk all of that, you have to remember the ultimate goal was to increase your odds of survival. And hopefully today you can see, I don't really actually think that's true. You've just traded the threat of others for the brutal threat and reality of nature. And one of those is far more consistent at winning than the other. The dog was victorious. Go 
It's a pretty dope spot though. You should come back there next time hop is here. Yeah, we'll bring them up. We could definitely do like a movie day thing just out here. I like kill the stink bug. Oops. Apparently those aren't even called stink pugs. I don't know what they are. They're the beetle or something. Oh, are they fucking over here as well? Oh, they are. Oh, we interrupted their... Their coitus. Their coitus. 